Around about the 1960s, the history of philosophy of physical education began to distance itself a little bit from general educational philosophies because physical education as a discipline was separate. And so therefore, a new philosophy as it related specifically to physical education and kinesiology needed to be adopted. Some of the early scholars are listed there. But coming down even a decade later, then we have some new formations of and societies, the PSSS Society, which is now called the International Association for the Philosophy of Sport, or the IAPS. So do be familiar with those acronyms. And even later down the road, around about the mid-1970s, we have the formation of the Journal of the Philosophy of Sport. And that's still one of the most prominent journals as it relates to sport philosophy now. These journals are a rich source of information, particularly because they have a large variety of, prof of professors and scholars from multidisciplines who may have interactions or dealings, uh, interdisciplinary dealings with philosophy and sport, and they contribute to these types of journals. So it's a very rich source of information. Some of the research methods that you would often find in that particular journal usually they pull from inductive, deductive, or, or descriptive. Of course, there are a variety more options to choose from, but these are some of the major research methods. And the first is inductive reasoning. And that's something where you take a, a very specific case and then you use it to, to generalize it across a larger group of people. And sometimes that can't happen. Sometimes individual studies cannot be generalized and that's okay because they'll become case studies and that information still has relevancy to the field. The second type is deductive reasoning and that's kind of going the opposite direction where we begin with, with broad uh, factual or, or uh, you know, hypothetical premises. And then we're trying to take that and narrow it down into more specific conclusions or pieces of information. And then the third method is descriptive reasoning. And descriptive reasoning does share some similar characteristics with, with a couple of these measures and also with a case study. And they begin with one example of some phenomenon, something that, that may have occurred, and then vary it to see how, how dramatically it changes, and that's known as phenomenology. So, or it's change or it's absence, you know, whatever factors, whatever, whatever variables are, are present um, and allows a more accurate description of some of its main foundational characteristics. So, so these, all three of these aspects hold value. And sometimes we'll see mixed methodologies where a couple of them are present in one study. This is just a, a graph or, or a graphic organizer of what we just talked about in a little bit more clear format. So once again, inductive reasoning, we start with a specific case and then we're trying to generalize it to a larger population of people. And deductive reasoning is, is kind of the other way around. You have general principles and we're trying to pull specifics from that. And then your descriptive reasoning. So we're going to look at an example or a couple of examples and how it describes um, and describe the essential qualities of that particular example. <clears throat> As we move on to the overview of knowledge and philosophy, these are just some of the, of the main points that we want to touch on, who our clients are and what a person is. Once again, a subjective type of, of question or aspect, the nature of the person. And once again, this is also subjective because depending upon who you ask or who the interviewer is, who your friends are, you're going to get a different answer. Specifically, what this means is the mind-body relationship, and this is one of the reasons why we have these different spheres of physical activity, because all of the spheres would contribute differently to the philosophy of that particular activity. Just like Tai Chi or yoga or Pilates has a different philosophy even within physical activity versus something like a competitive sport, football, rugby, tennis, gymnastics, um, ice hockey, curling, all of those would have different philosophies and read just with the nature of the activity because those aren't mind-body compared to yoga and things of that nature. Third bullet point, the nature of the sport and the competition and the relationships to work and play, which is also another word for, for leisure uh, when we talk about play. So th there is a, a bit of a difference with competition with sports because sometimes certain sports are exhibition only and certain sports are competitive. And so the nature of the sport goes beyond just if it's a team sport or a dual sport or an individual sport. There's also competitive aspects that, that come into play. Division one, two, or three. Are you NCAA? Are you NAIA? Are you USCAA? 
and all of these different natures of the sport and the governing body of sports that they fall under would play into the philosophy, the philosophy of that activity. Values promoted, and um, there are, are many of value promoted. I personally think that um, competitive natures can be increased through athletic performance, but also you learn time management, you learn ethical values, you learn control, you learn sportsmanship and teamwork. All of these things can be accomplished through physical activity and sport. And of course, we already touched on our ethical values as well. Pardon me. Now we come to the per the person problem. And the person problem really is kind of an individual issue because this varies, of course, with everyone in your moral upbringing and whether or not you have anger issues and whether or not you're a good sport or whether or not you allow your performance to dictate your mood. So there are so many different things that mm -hmm. come into play. And once again, these things can vary just with the rising and setting of the sun. Materialism is the human being is nothing more than basically a machine. OK, just think of, of that old movie, The Matrix. And their subjective experiences are real, but they really don't have very much power or meaning. They're just subjective experiences and they don't hold a great deal of value, if any at all. That's really what materialism is saying, that how you feel is a completely moot point and it, it doesn't give credence to pretty much anything. And then we come to the concept of dualism, which is the mind and the body are completely separate. Our thoughts count. Um, priority is given to the mind, of course. And then there is the concept of holism, and that is looking at the body through an interdependent uh, lens, a, a larger lens, a kaleidoscope, if you will, where everything plays into everything. Your mind plays into how the body reacts to stimuli and the body plays into or the body's performance or lack thereof can impact the mind. And we see that that is really more of an accurate perspective, because if you look at athletes falling into slums, and then sometimes there is no actual rationale for the way that they're performing other than their mind has just taken over and the confidence levels have fallen. And then you see at other individuals who may not have a strong of a mindset, but as their performance increases, they begin to gain more confidence. So there is quite a bit of interdependency and why the concept of holism as it specifically relates to physical activity and the philosophy of physical activity is given much more credence than materialism or dualism. Understanding the popularity of sport. Oh, it's massive. And I can't wait till we get to chapter, I believe it's chapter five, or, but I'm not particularly sure, where we talk about some of the sociological aspects of sport and how it's just a literal billion dollar industry and the number of consumers, even within our current pandemic situation, the numbers of sport consumers are so massive that it really does play into not only the popularity, but also the economy and how much money is contributed or traded between consumers of sport and the organizations that provide that service. So these are some of just uh, the listings for, for how popular the sport can be. Um, we have showcases, we have the entertainment value, we have competitive and fair sport, we have people who engage in it from a more recreational, leisure, delightful play standpoint. Then we have sport as a beneficial duty that really doesn't play too much into us unless you are part of the professional athlete spectrum and you are being paid for those services. But it's not so much beneficial um, from a fiscal point of view if we are not an actual um, giver of that particular activity or sport and then being paid for the services. Uh, so beneficial duty. And think of somebody who is benefiting greatly and that's really the person getting paid. <clears throat> And then, of course, we can take all of these aspects, including the fact that there are built in inefficiencies or artificial cr problems that are created, um, unlike the rest of life where we, we, we can't control some of the problems. But all of these aspects play into how meaningful the sport is and what the contributions to life and to the rest of the economy are. So it's quite a bit listed here. Some of the values that we have for physical activity, we talked about a few of them, some being sportsmanship, teamwork, time management, particularly for college athletes, and not just those who are in a sport, but those who are involved in any sort of physical based extracurricular activity and that can include dance and drama. If you're in a marching band, then even though it's a performing art, it still has a physical aspect to it. It's not a sport, but it is um, a, a performing art. 
And I believe that I'm probably one of the more impartial people to make that assertion because I uh, actually studied music in depthly and was in multiple choirs, multiple bands, participated in all of that. And it's just simply not the same as a sport. So anything can be done for a sport but it's not necessarily a sport and there are distinct benefits associated with the sport versus that of a performing art. So they're both valuable in their own right and they do have quite a bit of cross uh, connection, but they're not the same and that has to be acknowledged. And some of the values that we have um, are conceptions of the importance of things that we use to make the decision. So how we feel, if it's important to us, then that's how we're gonna base our decisions. And that's for personal and professional matters, including those in the workplace. And then our moral values and our moral values, the things that we're supposed to do or should do, those play into what happens on the field, what happens when we compete in sport. And then non-moral values refer to objects of desire, such as happiness, you know, think, basically the things that we want. Um, and a lot of times the things that we want are to win and that can lead our behaviors to be a little bit less than desirable based upon all moral or ethical codes. Some of the values promoted by the field, and we've talked about quite a bit, and I'm probably just gonna skip over this slide, but the main one I want to, to talk about before doing so is the health-related aspects of fitness. So health-related aspects of fitness are things such as cardiovascular endurance, and that is your heart and your lung health, muscular endurance, muscular strength, um, flexibility, things of that and body composition. And all of these things can be accomplished through physical fitness. And that's why we test physical fitness on multiple levels. Speed and power, those are sport-related aspects, which also have quite a bit of cross when they come into the health aspects of fitness. But the health aspects are primarily the ones that are going to keep us living longer and healthier. And you don't have to be fast. You don't have to be agile or have a lot of coordination to be healthy. You just need to have a good BMI count and a healthy cardiorespiratory system and a basic flexibility and, and some muscular strength and endurance. Now, think about the things that you value. Okay, what, how do you rank the four values cited? And let's go back just for a moment. Okay, health, knowledge, motor skills, act, pleasure, or fun. Uh, this really should be the health aspect, should be the most important, and followed closely by knowledge, just because it's hard to do the other ones if you're not healthy enough. And you'll also find that it's very cumbersome. And just myself, I had put on a, a, some petty weight, 10, 15 pounds or so, and I just noticed going up and down the stairs, I would skip scare, stairs. I said, this is a little bit more cumbersome than, than I, I don't want to be breathing harder at the top of the staircase. So I went ahead and cut that weight just because for my own personal health and fitness, I felt that it was better for me to be able to do these activities without breathing hard at the, at the conclusion of them. So I do think that health wise, we need to look at um, the aspects that are the most important and the ones that will allow us to be able to enjoy the activities. And we can't do that if we're not overall healthy. Some of the ethical obligations that sports people have and keep that word ethical and obligations, uh, no, keep it in mind that they vary with the person you're asking. Um, but these are just some of the, the aspects that one might consider important. Are these things done right or wrong within sport? Um, how should we behave? Do we have an ethical obligation to be nice and kind or should just, we just be cordial? Should we be defensive? Should we be impartial? Um, should we be unnecessarily critical or constructively critical? Should we all follow a universal point of view when it comes to morals and ethics? Um, should one person count more than the other? Is the quarterback more important than the running back? Is the referee more important than the point guard? Is the coach more important than the water guy? So all of these things are some of the ethical obligations. And is it okay to, to break rules as long as they're not really broken if they're just kind of, uh, we skirt at the guideline? Is it okay to do that? These are also some of our basic behavioral guidelines for the sports. Uh, of course, follow the rules, uh, respect your opponent. You, you see a lot of these things, they really don't get followed. Let me just be totally honest. Uh, some of these things, we we believe that they should be done such as rule following but then going back to the previous slide when we talk about ethics if the ref didn't see it then technically was it wrong well from an ethical and moral perspective yes but once again that goes into the moral values of our individual in the person and whether or not we are going to uphold those in the participation of said sport